This week on the show, we've got some new info on the talks from EuroBSDCon, a look at sharing a single ZFS pool between Linux and BSD, sandboxing, and much more. Stay tuned for your place to be, SD. Now, episode 170, Sandboxing Cohabitation, recorded November 30th, 2016. Hey, I'm your host, Chris Moore. And I'm Alan Jude. Yeah, we're glad to have you guys with us this week. We got a good episode here. Uh, we were just commenting, man, we uh, we both had a lot of stuff going on this yeah. morning and last night. It's just been busy, and it's hard to believe tomorrow's December, but uh, you know, we're going into the holidays strong. There's a lot of stuff still happening out there, mm -hmm. and of course, we're going to keep you abreast of everything. So uh, I guess as we get started here, we're going to do a quick look back at some stuff that happened earlier this year at EuroBSD gone uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. So tell us what happened there, Alan, and why we don't have videos of that. Uh, well, you know, they, they had uh, one group of people set up to do the video, but then they had to do a different conference. Uh, okay. They ended up having to do that. And then the second group ended up not being able to do it either. And uh, so we ended up with no video for EuroBSDCon. Uh, hmm. Sadly, due to circumstances beyond the control of the organizers, they tried very hard. They, you know, they had mm -hmm. a video they had a set of video people and a backup set of video people, and both ended up falling through. Uh, <laughs> right. The redundancy failed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, however, they have managed to collect the slide decks from, I think, almost every single speaker. Um, okay. And uh, so you can at least uh, see some of the content. There's a bunch of uh, really good ones. I like the... Um, uh, George Neville Neal's keynote was good, although I don't know that the slides tell... You know, it's, they're missing most of the jokes. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> um, Although some of them are in there, it's just not as funny when not delivered as a punchline. Uh, but also mm -hmm. the closing keynote by uh, Gert Doring about uh, mm -hmm. denial of service attacks, internet self-regulation, and the consequences and so on. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, oh, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a lot of good content in there. You know, there was uh, Dtrace Internals by Aaron Thomas. That was uh, lots of good information in there. Uh, but, you know, all of the different talks were very good. Uh, and there was... Lots of different things to pick from. Nice, nice. So, okay. Whatever we'll you're about the next in, conference. And, uh, yeah. Uh, some of these, yes. Uh, since there is no video, some of these uh, you will be able to catch at uh, maybe another conference uh, next year. Mm -hmm. uh, or I don't think very many of these are ones that were already at a different conference earlier this they year. They weren't at BSD Can or something. Uh, a couple of these might have been, but most of the, I think like uh, Brooks Davis's Hello World one, I know was at BSD Can. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can find the video for that one there. Uh, but I think most of these other ones are newer, and uh, so maybe you can catch them at BSDCAN this uh, coming year in 2017. Hmm. Okay. Very nice, very nice. Well, I see we also have some uh, MeBSD stuff starting to trickle out online. Yes, uh, the first uh, couple of talks are in here. Uh, so we have the jail networking, uh, using uh, taking FreeBSD from dev to production in the cloud, uh, OpenZFS, uh, and mostly the history of uh, Risk V5 or Risk Five, sorry. Mm. Uh, Beehive at age six. Uh, FreeBSD, <laughs> a brief history of the early days, and then uh, your talks in here unveiling TrueOS. Okay. Uh, Jordan Hubbard's uh, FreeNAS 10, and mm -hmm. uh, PCI pass through for FreeBSD VMs on Hyper-V. Um, nice. Okay. So how many more are missing? I don't. My panel. Oh, that sounds like a lot of them, or a bulk of them, anyway. Yeah. Uh, I know a couple of these. Maybe are, there's are like three or four more. Recent. Yeah, I know, I know mine's, there's mine, and I wonder how many other ones. Anyway, um, most of the videos are online here. Uh, you can definitely check those out. Uh, I think the last couple will show up uh, shortly thereafter. Um, okay. And then we and also then we have, have a trip, a trip report, report to go yes. with it. Yeah. So tell us about that. Who did this one? You did that on purpose, didn't you? What was that? <laughs> You saw the name and decided I had to pronounce it. I decided you had to pronounce it, yes. That was an on-the-fly decision. I was like, I'm going to throw that to Alan. He can choke on that. <laughs> I'm not just use his IRC nickname. It's D. Stolfa. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I can't try to pronounce your first name. Um, well, I'll take a stab okay. at Demonjo, Mongo, Solfa, Stoltfla. Uh, yeah, I butchered it, I'm sure. Anyway, 
I apologize. But yeah, Alan, tell us about what he said. That yes. was the more interesting. <laughs> uh, so yes, the FreeBSD Foundation sponsored his trip uh, from Croatia, I think, uh, to MeetBSD in California, uh, where he attended both the FreeBSD Developers and Vendor Summit and uh, the actual conference itself. And he would like to thank the uh, FreeBSD Foundation and the community for making it possible for him to attend. Uh, and also, uh, Michael Dexter helped him find a roommate uh, to share a room with uh, to reduce the cost. Um, oh, nice. He arrived at Berkeley uh, with his uh, roommate and checked in, uh, where he promptly ran into Michael Dexter, myself, and Rod Grimes sitting around in the lobby. Uh, he spent the night uh, in the lobby discussing things instead of going to sleep, even though he'd been awake for a very long time. Uh, mm -hmm. It was uh, nice to get to meet him. Uh, We've been talking on IRC quite a bit because he had been working on uh, some T-Trace uh, interesting stuff. Hmm. Uh, okay. He arrived at the first day of the Developer and Vendor Summit where he met everyone and had uh, uh, some discussions about Beehive with Peter Grehan, uh, who Michael Dexter introduced him to, and talking about D-Trace with Robert Watson, uh, Arun Thomas, uh, James McGullery, and uh, Samuel Lepetet. Uh, the talks kicked off uh, with a talk from Intel uh, talking about their netbooting stuff. Uh, and then they have mm -hmm. need want and all the other interesting stuff that happens there. Sure. As it is on the second day, uh, we, they began with the introduction circle. Basically, everyone at the conference stood around the, the room in a giant circle and went around introducing themselves and what they mm -hmm. liked about uh, BSD. Uh, he said it was great to see the diversity of the people attending the conference and how friendly the community is. Uh, then there was uh, Devin Tessie gave her talk on using jails with VNet and... Uh, all that stuff, quite a bit of interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, he also uh, got to meet with Ed Mast and uh, to get help uh, patching some of the AMD64 assembler code using linker sets uh, to make progress on some pair virtualization code that he'd been working on for Beehive. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he got to, to see the Risk Five talk and talk more about that. And then uh, at the Hillside Club, he got to uh, have a conversation with uh, Kirk McCusick about the history of the Hillside Club and, uh, mm. you know, some not necessarily computer-related stuff, which is one of the nice things about the dinner when you get to talk about other That's stuff true. as well. Sometimes I'm tech-talked out by the, by the end of the conference. Like, yeah. I, I've had enough of that for a day. <laughs> that doesn't happen to me, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss other things <laughs> as well. Yeah. No, I, I reach about a point where I'm like, I'm just like brain fried, yeah. you know, fuse blown, I'm, I'm done. I need to go do something else. Yeah. <laughs> and this, on the third day, uh, Rod Grimes opened the session with his talk about the history of FreeBSD. After that, he uh, uh, got to sit with Ed Mast again to work on some stuff and then uh, went to Jordan Hubbard's talk. Uh, during lunch, he got to ch chat with uh, Robert Watson some more about uh, detracing Beehive guests and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and then he mm -hmm. went to your talk about TrueOS and uh, OpenRC and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he uh, got to go with uh, Robert Watson, Ben O'Rice, and John Baldwin uh, to discuss a new IPC or RPC mechanism. Uh, so he got mm. to, you know, have quite a few Any big details. Um, I know Benno's working on something. I don't, or investigating okay. something. I don't know uh, what's come out of it yet. Maybe we can ask okay. Benno on Tuesday. <laughs> Yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll keep our ears open and see what we find. Uh, and at near the end of the uh, conference, there was the group photo taken outside, and uh, you know we gave a bunch of uh, short talks about our experiences at the conference and so on. Mm, and then okay. uh, after the closing, uh, we socialized in the hacker lounge and talked about uh, you know future meetings that we might have and where everybody was going to be next. I know, mm -hmm. uh, as I say goodbye to each person, we almost always just communicated where what the next thing we we're going to be at. And it's like, okay, I will sure. see you in uh, Belgium and I'll see On you the in Tokyo of the world, and I'll else. see you at BSD can. I don't even remember where people live now. I just associate them by which conference we've seen yep. at, right? Because we're never, we're never in our native environment. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, good he stuff. Says, uh, was... his, his closing remark is that attending MeetBSD has mm -hmm. further motivated him to contribute to the FreeBSD project and was a great learning experience as well as an opportunity to meet people that I previously talked to only over email or IRC. He says he very much mm -hmm. looked forward uh, to the next conference that he'll be able to attend. Very cool. You know, very this, cool. This is, this is why we want to send more people to conferences because... For sure. You know, it's a trap. Once you go to a conference, uh, you're you're hooked, and you're going to go to as many. Yeah, you get you roped can. in, man. 
So speaking of, don't forget, Asia BSD Con's coming up. Call for Papers is open yep, for that. You have so, until uh, December 26th, so that's only mm-hmm. a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, yeah. it, it seems like December is far away, but it's already the end of November. Uh, and they're one of those conferences where they're, they're going to want a paper, too. So yeah. try and get it done early. Well, uh, don't put so, it off to the last Yeah. Uh, your extended abstract has to be in yep. by December 26th, and they will let you know which mm-hmm. talks they're accepting by January 10th or so, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, yeah, once you're accepted, you don't have very much time before they want the finished paper because uh, they want to get them printed and bound into a book, yep. uh, which is very important for that conference. Sure, sure. Okay, well, cool. We'll look forward to seeing hopefully some more of you guys at a future conference then. So let's move on here. So next up, we have uh, Eric McCorkle, who has uh, been contributing uh, different ZFS supports to the FreeBSD EFI bootloader code. Uh, that's probably what you may recall mm-hmm. his name from. Has posted a pretty in-depth look at how he set up a dual boot with FreeBSD and Gen2 Linux on the same ZFS volume. I know a bunch so of people that are looking to do, be able to do this. Yeah, yeah, and there's there's a, quite a few different ways to skin this cat, but I like his uh, solution here. But he starts off by giving us a little bit of background on how the layout's done. First of all, he points out that Grub's used as the bootloader, which allows booting both Linux and BSD directly. Um, another non-typical thing he mentions, though, was he uses Etsy FS tab to manage mount points instead of the typical ZFS mount usage, apart from the home data set. So we have uh, some stuff from the doc here where he talks about uh, data, for example, is a Z pool in this case. So data home is mounted to slash home, and all of its child data sets are mounted using the ZFS mount point system. And then he set up a data free BSD data set and all its child data sets, which house the free BSD system. They have all their mount points sent to legacy. And then also data Gen 2 and all its child data sets house Gen 2, of course, and have their mount points sent to legacy so that you can do Etsy FS tab mounting with them. Yeah, I, I so can how understand that, why you would yeah. do that. But um, I forget his actual name, but AVG at FreeBSD.org recently committed to head mm-hmm. a startup script that allows for uh, ZFS style boot environments where you put all of the a uh, bunch of sub data sets under the the actual uh, the boot environment. So okay. like uh, the, the Brian Drury style, where you have a bunch of sub data sets under you know boot slash mm-hmm. default or uh, root slash default, uh, and mm-hmm. this script will mount only. So you set them all to no auto, and it will automatically mount the ones for the boot environment you selected. Hmm. So using okay. that, you could avoid having to do the FS tab on the FreeBSD side. You still have to do it on the Gen 2 side, although it's a shell script, so it might yeah. work on Gen 2 as well. But Probably could bring it over yeah. and make some modifications. Yeah. Uh, so okay. you might uh, be able to you know, improve this by getting away from the actual FS tab thing, although mm-hmm. only in I, – I, I don't think it's in 11, so you know, sure. it's a little uh, – it doesn't – so these instructions are what will work on everything right now, so. Anyway, mm-hmm. continue. All right, so how exactly did he set this up? Well, he provided us a nice overview of the steps. So step one, of course, was using the FreeBSD installer to create the GPT and ZFS pool. And then he installed and configured FreeBSD with the native FreeBSD bootloader. And then he booted into FreeBSD, created the Gen 2 Linux data sets, and installed Grub at that point. Um, step, uh, I guess that was two and three. Step four was boot the Gen 2 Linux installer and then install Gen 2 into those new data sets. And step five was boot into Gen 2 and then do any finishing up configuration tasks. And he mentions that they could have been done in the other order, too. You could have started with Gen 2 and worked your way back. But he mentions he found the FreeBSD installer easier to use to initially do the bootstrap of getting GPT on the disk and setting up the zpool. But uh, the rest of the article actually walks us through all the gory commands that make up each of those steps. It's pretty long and detailed, so I didn't want to go through it by a, a command-by-command basis here. But uh, as well, he also shows how you can craft a grub config file, which is capable of booting both systems. Mm-hmm. So that's of interest as well. Um, yeah, the only comment I had is since he's using EFI personally, I probably would have tried it with Refine and then chain loaded each in- system's EFI boot code from there. So you could use the BSD uh, EFI bootloader and you know, kind of boot them in a native manner, but that's just how I would have done yeah, it. Grub the, works too. The main advantage uh, to not using to Grub do. is having loader.conf just work the normal way, right? Correct. And you get to see the BSD boot menus and do the typical B- BSD thing. Otherwise, uh, I know like we've seen issues in the past with Grub where it breaks D-trace in weird ways. And so there's some little edge cases. But anyway, that's just the way I would have done it. But still, if this is something you've been hoping to do, do a true, do a true dual boot of FreeBSD and Linux, take a look at this. He's got all the information you need to get yourself bootstrapped, set up, and uh, you can follow it to a T. Or if you want to change it up a little bit, as he mentions, you can. You know, Feel free to do that as well. Yep. 
Okay, here. So next up, let's so see. Before we go to our next article, there, eh? it is. It is, and I'm hoping we see more and more people do stuff like this, yeah. especially since we've done the the install into boot environment thing for TrueOS. I would think that would help yeah, make this easier. Yeah, it'd be very easy well. to take an existing Linux and with the mm-hmm. happens to have a ZFS pool and just kind of uh, splat. Yeah, as long as it other. finds the pool. And can and import it as long as you've set it up ahead of time where it has the boot environment style layout, then you should just be able to install directly into a fresh boot environment and then just do your bootloader bits and you're done. Yeah. But anyway, someday somebody will have to walk through on that. Right? They'll get there. They'll give them time. <laughs> anyway, well, they'd have to do it with Grub right now, and I don't I don't envy that. That sucks. Mm-hmm. We did that for years. It's horrible. It'd be anyway, really funny to see <laughs> the FreeBSD bootloader ported for Linux. Oh man. <laughs> that, yeah, that would be interesting. Okay, so before we go to our next article here, we do have our first sponsor this week, which we're going to be starting with IX Systems. So the website for that, of course, ixsystems.com slash BSD now, where you want to go there. And there's a little form you can fill out, put in some contact info, and uh, get in touch with another sales engineers. They'll also send you a guide on what to know when you're purchasing a server for open source, what kind of questions you should ask your vendors, and, you know, just important tips if you're trying to get the best experience possible out of uh, a purchasing. But uh, definitely get in touch with the folks of our diet. They can build everything and, you know, down to teeny little things, the FreeNAS Mini up to these mega powerhouse boxes we've shown in the past and uh, all running the latest and greatest Intel processors. You need a specific chip, let them know. They'll find it and make that work. Um, Of course, they do storage. They pretty much the cool thing is with IX, they like custom jobs. So it's not like you go look at their catalog and it's like, okay, well, they have 12 products and that's all I can buy. No, 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 no. You call them up and say, this is my problem. Here's the thing I need to solve, and they will walk through that with you and help design the best solution that gets you the most bang for your buck. You know, Don't waste money on components you don't need, but put that money into things that will really give you a benefit you know, performance-wise, You know, help you meet that minimum level of acceptable performance 100% of the time. So uh, definitely good to be in touch with those guys since they also speak the language too. It's not like calling some other vendors where you mention things like, I'm running a mail server or I'm using Postgres, and everyone's like, er, What's that? what? Is that like Oracle? What's that? Is that on that Linux thing I've heard about? Like, no, 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 no. Uh, Yeah, yeah. So you definitely want to talk to the guys at IX. They're going to speak the language, so to speak. (laughs) And they enjoy enjoy hearing from BSD Now listeners, too. So On their uh, Server Envy blog, they have the new hotness. Have you seen this thing? Which is Uh, it now? The, um, uh, how do they call it again? Microblade. Oh, yes, yes. So, so we this is a, a, a 6U one that we're looking at the picture of that has 28 mm-hmm. computers in it. Mm-hmm. You can see that it's got all these little blades, and each one is actually two whole computers. Yeah, so that's the one we took out to uh, uh, VMworld ah. just this summer and showed off. It's really, really, really cool. <laughs> so in, the, in this one, you see there's a computer at the back, there's the processor and your RAM and so on, and then there's a blank spot. That's where a whole second computer goes. And then mm-hmm. uh, up here is you have the common stuff, including uh, some SSDs for storage. Uh, and these, yep. uh, this particular one is all Xeon Ds, so they're really, really low power, but have even more uh, inner processor bandwidth than uh, even a Haswell machine. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. this whole setup is designed to reduce cabling, right? If you had 28 servers sure. in your rack, that would be a whole lot of cabling you would have to do. This mm-hmm. one, uh, they have these modules at the back that are just 40 gig uh, Ethernet fiber ports. And you just wire these yep. up into your switch and everything's connected. And then you have the uh, management system where you can uh, you know, manage all those nodes ideally. Uh, or you can actually it's use this cool. uh, instead of a dual 40 gig links, you can actually use it as eight 10 gig links if uh, you don't have any 40 gig switches or whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the use cases they mentioned there is uh, doing the 6U microblade. You could run over 7,000 VDI VMs at the low cost of usually around $30 a VM. Mm-hmm. And it consumes just a quarter of a watt per VM, yeah. which is crazy. But yeah, yeah so really, really if you cool. filled up a 6U one, that would be 28 individual hot swappable blade servers. Uh, each mm-hmm. blade built with you know two computing nodes, um, and it would only take eighteen hundred watts. <laughs> Just <Huh>? amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's enough. So that gives you, uh, you know, if you filled the entire rack with these, that'd be three hundred ninety-two computers with uh, a total of fifty terabytes of RAM, two hundred eighty terabytes of bandwidth, and uh, six thousand two hundred seventy-two cores. 
Yeah, per rack. Yeah. <laughs> like, done. <laughs> Amazing. So, yeah, IX systems, again, they can go all the way up to the highest end you need and then all the way down if you need a little mini to go sit under your desk. But uh, definitely get in touch with them. They have some really cool solutions that will hopefully be able to power whatever it is you need to do going into the future. Yeah. It's like if you need one computer or if you need one computer that's yeah. actually 28 computers, they can do that. Mm-hmm. That's right. And they like a challenge, too. Mm-hmm. Call them up. Tell them something crazy. See if they can do it. <laughs> okay, so what's the next thing we got here, Alan? I guess uh, we got some Harden BSD news you need to tell us about. Uh, yes, so uh, Harden BSD has introduced the uh, Clang Safe Stack feature into their base system. Oh, okay. Uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, so Harden BSD has integrated uh, Safe Stack uh, in their base system and in the ports tree, it's available as a config option, but it's only specifically turned on for things where it's been tested. But you, uh, mm-hmm. as a user, can turn it on for additional things and do that testing. Uh, so sure. SafeStack is part of the Code Pointer Integrity Project at Clang. Uh, Clang's mm-hmm. description here says, SafeStack is an instrumentation pass that protects programs against attacks based on stack buffer overflows. Uh, sure. Without introducing any measurable performance overhead, I think it's like... 0.1% or something. Uh, it yeah. works by separating the program stack into two distinct regions. There's the safe stack and the unsafe stack. So the safe mm-hmm. stack uh, stores things like return addresses, uh, register spills, local variables, and so on that are fixed size. Um, sure. And then all the other stuff that maybe could overflow or something somebody could do something bad to goes on the unsafe stack. Uh, so mm-hmm. this way, if they do overflow a text buffer or whatever, they can't overwrite a return address and cause your program to jump into code they Mm. supply. Sure. Uh, The separation assures that buffer overflows on the unsafe stack cannot be used to overwrite anything on the safe stack. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, So uh, I guess on November 28th, which was this Monday, when Clang 3.9.0 was imported into the FreeBSD head, uh, safe stack... uh, the version of safe stack included in Clang 3.9.0 uh, mm-hmm. only supports being applied to applications and not to shared libraries at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, multiple patches have been submitted to Clang by third parties to add support for shared libraries, so uh, maybe we'll hmm. see that in the next version. But sure. it's on in Harden BSD, and, uh, but currently it's AMD64 only. They don't have it for uh, ARM or anything else yet. That makes sense. So I guess uh, Clang 3.9.0 is now in head, huh? Um, it got pulled into base. I don't know get- if a head's actually updated to it yet, but uh, I know that there's been a bunch of work to, to get it to that point. Mm-hmm. So since we ripped our Clang out, we just got to switch a variable and say, now we're going to build with 3.9.0 yep. in our build system and just be done with uh, it. You, but, you yeah, build from be, the ports version? Or? Yeah. Yeah, we build from the ports version. So that'll be cool. I'll have to definitely take a look at that, See, uh, see if we can switch over to it here soon, mm-hmm. too. Okay, so next up, we've talked a lot about uh, OpenBSD's sandboxing mechanism pledge in the past, but today we have a really great article by Chris Stapps, who tells us about how he grew to love it for web sandboxing. Mm -hmm. First up, he gives us his opening argument that should make you sit up and listen. He said, I use application-level sandboxing a lot because I make mistakes a lot. When writing web applications, the price of making mistakes is very dear. In the early 2000s, that meant using SysTrace on OpenBSD and NetBSD. Then it was SecComp followed by LibSecComp on Linux. Then there was Capsicum on FreeBSD and then Sandbox Init on Mac OS X. All these systems are invoked differently, and for the most part, whenever it came time to interface with one of them, I longed for the sweet release from the nightmare. Please try reading SecComp to the end. Aligning web application logic and security policy would require an arduous, usually trial and error worse, copy and paste process, if there was any process at all. If the burden of writing a policy didn't cause me to abandon sandboxing at the start. He said, then there was Pledge. This document is about Pledge and why you should use it and love it. Interesting. Not convinced that you should read this yet? Well, maybe you should take his challenge, which I thought was good. He said, let's play a drinking game, and the challenge is to stay out of the hospital. <laughs> he said, navigate to the SecComp man page, and he has the link here. Read it to the end, and then drink every time you don't understand. <laughs> That's a little scary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he said, uh, for Capsicum, the challenge is no less difficult. To see these in action, he said, navigate no further than OpenSSH, which interfaces with these sandboxes. So he provides some links here. We have a sandbox set comp filter or sandbox Capsicum. He said you can even refer back to a sandbox SysTrace if you want to see the old stuff. But he said, keep in mind that these do little more than restrict resources to open descriptors and the usual necessities of memory signals, timing, etc. He said, keep that in mind and be horrified. Now, Christoph, 
Ravs has a theory on why these are so difficult and starts with NS and ends in another number or letter. But uh, he said, perhaps there's a better way. He then goes on to make the case that pledge sits right in that sweet spot, being powerful enough to be useful, but easy enough to implement that developers might actually use it. Um, all in all, it's a really detailed, nice read talking about some of the reasons why he thinks pledge kind of fixes a lot of these problems. We'd love to hear other developer success stories using pledge as well. I don't know if you have the chart, if you can show it there, Alan, if you have the site open Which where he shows his little top one or the bottom one. Uh, he has the little, I think the one on the bottom yeah. where he has the little graph showing kind of where pledge yep. sits on the, on the chart here of um, ease of use versus its capabilities. And so in his view, anyway, a sandbox in it is just easy and coarse. So it doesn't almost not useful. And then pledge is kind of in that sweet spot right in the middle, easy enough to use that people want to use it and will use it. But gives you still enough control to actually do useful things with it, and then of course he puts like set comp way up in the corner, yeah. so, <laughs> like, not for mere mortals. You know, I've I've done a a, a small amount of of capsicum now, and it's not really that hard. Although it really depends on how the application is structured. Um, mm-hmm. Certain ways of designing the application make capsicum really easy, and some patterns make it much more complicated. Uh, so yeah. if the application kind of has this idea that it's going to want to be sandboxed, uh, it's already going to have all the right separation and it's just a matter of mm-hmm. plugging in Capsicum and it's really easy. Uh, but especially when trying We're, to apply Capsicum to programs written like 15 plus years ago, yeah, uh, it's like, yeah, I, you can see We're never that fortunate, shortcuts you, you took. Know? Uh, uh-huh. But, you know, I, I even made it work with NetBSD's find. It's just rather a it's a little bit bigger of a patch than I'd really like. Uh, sure. Well, he has a, a pretty good summary here. He said, in the argument of complexity and thoroughness, pledge is a compromise. It acts like a series of usage profiles instead of focusing on the physical motions themselves. Much like one could simply say eating instead of saying raising food to mouth, masticating, swallowing, etc. If your utility needs to read a file, as he shows in another example, you don't need to whitelist each system call involved of reading files. You just enable a profile for reading files that includes fstat, and, you know, fshown, etc. And then he has a link to uh, one of Theo's videos where you can read more about that. But uh, anyway, I think uh, you know, yes, it sounds pretty no, convincing uh, reading through the this. The downside <laughs> to pledge is that you can't say, oh, you can read from this file, but you can only write to that file. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, basically, if you give, if, if you have the ability, to, if you need to be able to read and write from, a, uh, from two different files, you have to allow read and write to any files that you're allowed to open. Whereas with Capsicum, sure. for example, with BSD patch, is like the first file you're just going to read and nothing else. The second file mm. you're going to read and maybe seek, and the third file you're going to only write and seek, and that, and those are the only things you can do. And so Capsicumizing BS patch was really really easy. It's like open sure. the FDs, lock it down so they can only do those things, and then execute the code. Uh, whereas mm. you know some applications, it's it's a lot more work to to teach you to do that, especially anything that. For sure kind of opens files later on, you, you know, where during execution, it's going to randomly decide to, to do something different than, you know, mm-hmm. but yeah, still it's, it's neat. I think, I think we need more systems like this to make it easier because a system can be great, but if it's too difficult to implement and use, then the, the, I guess the concern is that nobody does it at all. Right. And then you, you end up with something where you don't have any, any extra sandboxing where right. something would well, have been uh, better than what nothing. Was, in what was case. interesting with Capsicum is that it turned out a lot of it isn't that hard. It's just that everybody thought it was right. Everybody had to, mm-hmm. you know, there was this rumor that it was really difficult. Uh, I just ignored that. Sure. And it's like, oh, look, I capsicumized <laughs> this in like an afternoon. And, uh, you know, and nice. it's because I had to read all the man pages to learn how to do it because I had no idea how any of it worked. Uh, and then, you know, that started, a, you know, kind of a, a little chain reaction. And there's a whole group of us working mm-hmm. on things now. And it's actually getting done. Yeah. How, do you know what percentage of the base system has been converted over yet? Uh, no, but... Uh, by the end of the current little project, every tool used in something like PortSnap, FreeBSD update, mm-hmm. uh, or anything like that will, those... will be covered, uh, which is Perfect. to us, I think, is more important than, you know, oh, we pledged, yeah. you know, 20% of all the tools. Top. Uh, <laughs> well, because uh, the biggest problem with pledge is that if you allow the exec uh, 
I don't know, attribute or whatever it's called, um, mm-hmm. you can just start another program that's not in a sandbox at all and can do whatever it wants. And it's like, mm, so okay. if I'm in the sandbox, but I'm allowed to start another program that's not in the sandbox, I can just do whatever I want. Now, not every program mm. has that, but I think about half of the ones that are pledged have allow that uh, because they need oh, to usually. Um, whereas with Capsicum, if you start a second program from inside your program, it's in the same sandbox. Hmm. It can only okay, ever have less, guys who do pledge. Uh, you have to write in now and tell us, you know, how how you deal with that. Just out of well, for my own case, if, I'm if curious. If the program like, you're exactly really is also me. pledged, then <laughs> it ends up in a sandbox. But mm-hmm. anyway, well, that's <laughs> good stuff. Well, I'd love to hear other developer success stories, though, using Pledge or Capsicum or other solutions. You know what people's experiences were. So write us, let us know. I'd be curious to hear. Okay, moving over to the news roundup. So we got some good stuff to start with here. So first up, uh, we'll go through this one quickly, but I think some of you may want to pay attention to this. So OS News had a little tidbit on their site today talking about uh, the entire commit history of Unix now being available online, starting all the way back to 1970 and bringing us forward to today. So they're linking to something that got posted up on GitHub, a new repo, which I'll read you a little excerpt from the readme about what this is. So the history and evolution of the Unix operating system is made available as a revision management repository covering the period from its inception in 1970 as a 2.5,000 line kernel and 26 commands to 2016 as a widely used 27 million line system. The 1.1 gigabyte repository contains about half a million commits and more than 2,000 merges. The repository employs Git system for its storage, and of course it's hosted on GitHub. It has been created by synthesizing with custom software 24 snapshots of the systems developed at Bell Labs in the University of California, Berkeley, and the 386 BSD team, two legacy repositories, and the modern repository of the open source FreeBSD system. In total, about 1,000 individual contributors are identified, uh, early ones through primary research, the data set can be used for empirical research into software engineering, information systems, and software archaeology. So you should go click at this and look. It's hard, it's hard to describe it. Just looking through the list of branches and like seeing all the different Unix revisions mm-hmm. is really fascinating. And I'm sure this is a fascinating find, especially if you're a student or maybe a historian who wants to look back in time and see how Unix evolved. And this repo, of course, uh, ultimately brings you all the way up to modern FreeBSD, yeah. so you can start today and move your way back as much as you need I to. I know. Uh, uh, cool. FreeBSD committer uh, Seven Janian, uh, who I guess is also NetBSD package source and lots of other things, um, mm-hmm. has been doing a history project where he's actually been going through and editing the history section of the man pages uh, to mm. correct, you know, uh, oftentimes the man page mentions when a tool sure. first appeared. Uh, and it turns some out of some of those were wrong and a lot of them were missing. And so with uh, information like this, he managed to piece together. It's like, oh, that tool appeared this date and, and fill in those blanks in the man pages. That's really yeah. cool. I, uh, <laughs> I helped him commit about 20 of those. And then I'm like, uh, somebody give him a commitment so I don't have to do Yeah, yeah I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. All right. Uh, well, <laughs> I, worse was he got the commit bit the day after I did all that. So uh, I was like, "Why did I just uh, spend all that? Uh, I spent all night. Ma- well, he wanted to make sure they were uh, a bunch of them got committed before EuroBSDCon because uh, he was doing a sure. presentation about it. So actually, yes, if you go back to the links at the top of the show, uh, you can read his slides about that project. Um, nice, but yeah. So he got to have his commit bit, but it just like <laughs> I just I spent a whole bunch of time rushing getting that done for him before I had to get on an airplane so that it would be done in time, and then. It's like he could have just done it himself. Right, still, he got a commit, but it's all good. Exactly. So going forward, hopefully, yeah, it's not on you anymore. Mm-hmm. But still, it's neat to see people going through it. I'm sure this repo will be invaluable mm-hmm. to the kind of folks who need to go through and do stuff like that. Or if you're a grad student, you know, doing research, definitely bookmark this yeah. one. You'll probably need to refer back to. Or you know, if you just happen, uh, I know. Uh, like uh, Marie Helen was working on uh, if config and lip if config, and she was like, mm-hmm. "Where did that piece of code come from?" It's like, well, you can walk right. back through the history and go, it's like, you know, it, the FreeBSD repo doesn't say because it's from before uh, the repo started, right? It's like uh, Rod so Grimes was saying, is, is. Like, a lot of the stuff gets blamed on him by SVN because he did the original import. <laughs> yep. Well, the thing that's got to suck is like if there's security things that are found that have been lingering for decades, like now we can go back and find out who was the person who, who put that in originally. Yes. Like, aha, 
for 20 years. Committed at 3.30 in the, the morning foot. local time uh-huh. in 1981. Yes, with misspelled commit message, obviously drunk. <laughs> Great. Well, I, I'm just remembering uh, you were there for HBSDCOM when Robert Ells uh, from Australia mm-hmm. gave his talk about uh, like hot seating, where it's like, yes. uh, you know, one programmer would sit there and work until a certain time and then he would stand up and somebody else would sit down at that computer and start working because they only had so many computers. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of that history in a little bit. But first, got to get to the next story, yes. Alan. So I'll let you do about uh, Yandex here. Tell me what's uh, going on. So Yandex has uh, done some work, uh, specifically reworking the IP try forward uh, function to use the new FIB4 uh, kernel programming interface. So this commit brings some code from the experimental routing branch of uh, FreeBSD into head. So everything in there isn't uh, all sorted out and finished yet. Uh, but this bit is, and so we'll bring it into head. And um, hmm. Olivier from the BSD Router Project, who we've interviewed before, uh, did some benchmarks. Uh, he says his comment on the code review here is, I can't understand the code, but regarding only the performance benefits, it's great. So uh, the right. first graph here is uh, uh, shows the performance difference. So the brown is FreeBSD 12 head uh, at a recent revision with... Uh, without the patch, and then green is with the patch. Um, mm-hmm. And this is on a um, HP DL360P, which is an 8-core Xeon E5-2650. Um, and so you can see uh, the speed of forwarding packets with no firewall uh, went from about 2.6 million uh, to about 4.7 million packets per second. Mm. Uh, nice. Meaning that at the... Uh, uh, a theoretical mix of packet sizes based on what you normally see on the internet. So the packets per second is all minimum size packets, so 64 bytes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you instead applied that number of packets per second to you know, um, a regular size of packets you would see going across your router to the internet, uh, that basically takes you from about 7.5 uh, gigabits per second to... Uh, you know, 13.5 gigabits per second. So you go oh. from not being able to saturate your 10 gig NIC to being able to. That's if you use IPFW with uh, two rules, uh, you go from about uh, 2.3 million packets a second to 4.2, or from, you mm-hmm. know, uh, 6.5 gigabits per second to just under 12 gigabits a second. Or if hmm. using PF with two stateful rules, uh, your packets per second goes from about uh, 2.4 to 2.8 or 2.7 uh, million packets per second, or from under seven to almost eight uh, gigabits per second. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I'm just looking through the diff. It's actually not a super long no. diff either. Um, then he did the same tests on a four core Atom. So this is a, a NetGate uh, RCCV4860. So this is a, a little Atom box with a C2558 processor. Uh, mm-hmm. So with that smaller processor, the same patch uh, takes you from just over 700,000 packets per second to uh, about 950,000 uh, packets per second. Or from sure. about uh, 2 gigabits per second to uh, well over 2.5 gigabits per second. Hmm. But if you go up to an 8-core Atom with a Chelsea NIC, uh, then you get quite an improvement, uh, going from about uh, 1.1 million packets per second to 3 million packets per second, which is a very big game. Yeah, there's some big jumps here. This is pretty yeah, cool. And then with uh, IPFW going from about a million to uh, 1.75 million, uh, or from 3 gigabits to 5 gigabits per second. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think some people are going to want to pull this in. Yes. Uh, this has been committed this to is head. Good. <laughs> this is now built into 12. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I think I need to upgrade our head for TrueOS. Good stuff. Uh, well, this is stuff. only really applies to routers. Sure, sure. But, you know, mm-hmm. people want the latest. People see this kind of stuff and they're like, I don't know what people are using it for, right? Although I run TrueOS on my router, but I don't push that many packets for right. a second to justify it. But still, maybe someday I will. Yep. <laughs> we'll get five or thousand. <laughs> Okay, well, we need to get to our next sponsor this week, which is going to be DigitalOcean. The website for that, of course, DigitalOcean.com. There's no slash at the end of that, just DigitalOcean.com. 
after you've created an account, though, the trick is you want to go to the coupon code section where you can apply a, you know, put in your mm-hmm. your phrase or whatever. The phrase in this case is going to be free BSD now, not BSD now. Don't forget to put free in front of that. Free BSD now. That'll give you your ten dollar credit, which you know, ten dollar credit on DigitalOcean actually gets you quite a lot. I mean, you could run a VM for two months straight to their lowest end VM, which is still backed by SSDs, or you could pay per hour yep. and just rent some time. You know, maybe you're working on something on the it's weekend. Like, you only mm, need to spin it up a occasionally. One and a half cents an hour. Hour, and if I only need it on yeah. the weekends, or you know, even just for the live show that we're doing right now, there's a droplet out there that takes the mm-hmm. feed from the live stream and feeds it into YouTube so that people can watch it on Ooh. YouTube live on their phone or whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. Because some people have problems watching it over the regular stream. Uh, sure. That only has to be happening while shows are live. So there's actually an IRC yeah. bot. And you type a command, and it starts the droplet, and it boots up and starts the stream, and it goes up to you. And then when the show's over, you stop it. That's pretty and, cool. And, you know, with a price of, like, you know, 1.5 or 3 cents per hour, um, you know, it, it, it basically yeah. costs nothing to do that for two hours on Wednesday hours and, and two hours on Thursday. That's pretty cool. So you have an IRC bot hooked up to that. Huh? So using, I assume, some of their different APIs for programmatically yes. bringing uh, stuff up and down. They have a really so. nice API. Very cool. And yeah. So you just have a snapshot of the image ready to go, and you just say, hey, clone that, make me a VM, start it up. You know, a minute later, Do it's things, up and running, and, it and boom, your stream's live. Very nice, very nice. So, of course, you can do the same kind of stuff. And, of course, DigitalOcean offers free BSD droplets. If you want to run OpenBSD, you can do that. Net, Dragonfly, there's all kinds of neat things you can do there. Um, they recently deployed a ZFS-backed free mm-hmm. BSD droplets as well. That plus uh, you know, the block storage feature is quite, quite cool. So check it out today. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. There's a lot of neat things you can do by having a droplet up in the cloud that they way. They also have high memory droplets. If you need uh, mm-hmm. more RAM but not necessarily more CPU power. Uh, you mm-hmm. can just get, you know, it's like, oh, uh, cool. I need 128 gigs of RAM. It's like, well, that's only $1.43 an hour. If I only need it for a little yeah. bit, that's not bad at all. Oh, that's not bad at all, right? So that's definitely good stuff. Get in touch with them today. If you ever talk to anyone over there, tell them you heard about it here on BSD Now. Okay, so we got some more history stuff to look at today. We have a brief history of Unix socket multiplexing and the select uh, system call. So have you ever really wondered about the details of where this came from, socket multiplexing, and aka the history of select 2? Well, Merrick today gives us a treat, a quick look back at the history that's made today's modern multiplexing possible. So first of all, his article starts the way all good ones do, presenting the problem in silent movie form, which we won't play here, especially if you're just listening to the audio, that won't be so fun for you. But uh, when you get a chance, you should go check it out. It's kind of cool. But uh, we start in the 1960s. I'll just read this here. So in the mid-1960s, time sharing was still a recent invention. Compared to previous paradigm batch processing, time sharing was truly revolutionary. It greatly reduced the time wasted between writing a program and getting its result. Batch processing meant hours and hours and hours of waiting, often only to see a program error at the end. So see this film better to understand the problems of 1960 programmers. And we have the link to the silent movie there, which is pretty neat. I, I remember my mom saying at one point they had a card machine. Like she was young enough that they had one at their college at UCLA. So I never got to see that personally. I don't. But just seeing him jam the cards and they're trying to get it to go. I, I don't mess those days for sure. I'm glad we we have what we have today. But uh, then we take a step forward. We enter the wild world of the 1970s, and now we've reached the birth of Unix, which tried to solve the batch processing problem with time sharing. So these days when a program was executed, it could stall, a.k.a. block, only on a couple things now. So specifically, you could be waiting for CPU, waiting for disk I.O., or waiting for user input. So, for example, waiting for a shell command or the console. You know, you're printing data out too fast, so you need to take some time and let it get caught up. So interesting. So we've reached the 70s. But then when we jump forward another dozen years or so, the world changes yet again. So then we have here, this all started in 1983 with the release of 4.2 BSD. This revision introduced an early implementation of the TCP IP stack and, most importantly, the BSD Sockets API. Although today we take the BSD Sockets API for granted, it wasn't obvious it was the right API. At the time, streams were a competing API design on the System 5 Revision 3. Hmm. So coming in along with the Sockets API, however, was the Select Call, which our very own Kirk McCusick actually wrote in to give it a little background on. So he explains here that Select was introduced to allow applications to multiplex their I.O. He said, consider a single, a simple application like a remote login. 
it has descriptors for reading from and writing to the terminal and a descriptor for the bidirectional socket. It needs to read from the terminal keyboard and write those characters to the socket. It also needs to read from the socket and write to the terminal. Reading from a descriptor that has nothing queued causes the application to block until data arrives. The application does not know whether to read from the terminal or the socket, and if it guesses wrongly, it will incorrectly block. So select was added to let it find out which descriptor had available or had data ready to read. If neither, select blocks until data arrives on one descriptor and then awakens telling which descriptor has data to read. He said non-blocking was added about the same time as select, but using non-blocking when reading descriptors does not work well. Do you go into an infinite loop when trying to read each of your input descriptors? If not, do you just pause after each pass? And if so, for how long to remain responsive to input? Select is just far more efficient. He said select also lets you create a single inet daemon instead of having to have a separate daemon for every service. Interesting. Yeah, I never really thought about the history of that. But uh, interestingly enough, the article wraps up with an interesting conclusion. And uh, the author here says, uh, in this discussion, I was afraid to phrase the core question, were Unix processes intended to be CSP-style CSP processes, CSP being uh, communicating sequential processes? Are file descriptors a CSP-derived channel? Is select equivalent to alt statements? He says, I think no. Even if there are design similarities, they were accidental. The file descriptors Scripture abstractions were developed well before the original CSP paper. It seems like that, like, uh, but it seems that an op operating sockets API evolved totally disconnected from the user space CSP alike programming paradigms. It's a pity, though. It would be interesting to see an operating system coherent with the programming paradigms of the user land programs. So, all in all, I've kind of summarized this, but it's a really long article, a very good read. It's interesting to see the history of how modern multiplexing came to be. You know, hard to imagine a time before we had some of these modern conveniences, but uh, cool to hear some of the folks firsthand on the ground describe you know what the problem was and how this kind of changed their world so to speak at the time and uh, of course we all reap the benefits today all right anything you want to add on that alan or you want to move on uh, no i think that's uh you know, okay this really good stuff uh it's worth checking out. yeah definitely check it out today so uh let's see so the next one we have here is how to start uh see it what is that c lion okay yep, go ahead uh, yeah Tell so c, c lion, lion is. is a cross-platform c and c plus plus ide so it runs on mm -hmm. windows mac linux and uh, now bsd so by oh, default okay. the linux version comes bundled with some binaries that aren't going to work very well uh natively on freebsd including a java runtime engine a tool called fs notifier which is uh tells the application when a file uh on your disk changes so it can pop up in the ui Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you have a bunch of source code open and you do an SVN update or a git pull um, and it updates them, it can refresh them in the UI. Um, oh, nice. Uh, okay. libptty for uh, controlling apps that have a TTY, uh, CMake for compiling stuff, and GDB. Uh, mm -hmm. So, to start getting it working on FreeBSD, first you can install replacements for all those things. So, install OpenJDK, CMake, and GDB from native FreeBSD. Uh, then you just have to edit the... Um, C lion bin idea properties file and change uh, run processes with PTY to false so that it won't need libpty. And then mm -hmm. uh, under settings, build, execution, deployment, and tool chains, you can just change the paths to things like uh, CMake and GDB to point to user local bin the application. Sure. And it'll use the ones you installed from ports. And uh, that leaves just uh, the one problem uh, FS notifier. If you uh, okay. don't have FS notifier, it'll say you will be warned on startup that file sync may be very slow because it will have to check each file individually constantly. So, uh, mm -hmm. helpfully, someone has written a version of FS notifier that works on FreeBSD and OpenBSD because it doesn't require uh, mm -hmm. I notify that's uh, in the Linux kernel. So, uh, there's a link mm -hmm. here to a GitHub where there's FS notifier uh, is used by IntelliJ and other similar programs for detecting file changes. This version supports FreeBSD and OpenBSD via libinotify and is a replacement for the bundled Linux-only version that comes with IntelliJ's IDEA Community Edition. So do they port iNotify over? I don't it looks think like so. I'm looking at the repo. A, it's a libinotify that has a different way, a, like a BSD way of, of doing the same mm -hmm. thing rather than actually being a, mm. necessarily a port of uh, iNotify. Uh, I looked at the code and I didn't see it using KQ. I'm not entirely sure what it's doing. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Wonder if it provides the same API or whatever. If that could go into like the compat layer or whatever, know. it's the right license. Looks mm -hmm. like it's uh, 
Apache license. Yeah. So, hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, some, somebody will have to take a look at that. There's some good stuff there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so this is JetBrains uh, C API uh, for or C IDE. Uh, I've been looking for something because the, the IDE I'm using right now, Komodo Edit, is great for like scripting languages. It does great jobs on like Shell, uh, Perl, Python, you know, uh, mm-hmm. PHP, et cetera. It just doesn't do C worth anything. Uh, no, bummer. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I really want to run something that's based on Java, though. Uh, True. But uh, I might check this out. i to load some because... Java to do my C mm-hmm. code. All you need is VI. That's all you need. I'm convinced. Yeah, I just can't do VI. <laughs> <sighs> I'm telling you, I'm going to troll the true OS community. One of these days, I'm going to replace EE and Nano or whatever with a sim link. <laughs> it'll, bring up, it'll just bring up VI, not even Vim. <laughs> anyway, I think people would hate me for mm-hmm. that. But I've been really tempted to do that around the office a couple times here. We're going to force everyone to learn. Well, you know, I, I know use I Nano it for too. editing <laughs> config files, but I, I wouldn't try to use it for source code. Other than What do you use for source code? Komodo edit. Komodo, okay. Okay. Mostly because yeah. it well, gives me uh, exactly the same environment as what I have on all of my machines. Not doesn't matter which OS, and that sure. just soothes my brain when I'm trying to work. It's like I got my comfortable mm-hmm. environment no matter what. <laughs> uh, one of these days we're going to bring you to the dark side. <laughs> it's going to be good. <laughs> Okay, time for Beastie Bits. We've got quite a few things to get to, then, of course, feedback and questions, so stick around for that. So let's see. First up this week in the Beastie Bits, we have our new launch page, or I guess landing page landed for uh, TrueOS Pico, which I announced at uh, Meet BSE a few weeks back. Man, hard to believe that was already a few weeks ago. Anyway, <laughs> up there we have links. You'll be able to go download. Uh, we have a thin cl- It's basically a thin client solution for those who haven't seen the talk or heard about it. But uh, we have images for the Raspberry Pi 2 at the moment. That's the first image we've rolled. And then, of course, you install a package on your TrueOS box. They work their magic. You boot up your Raspberry Pi 2, and you get presented with a nice login screen, graphical login. And we've done all the work to the login manager and to the Lumina desktop, so they have a concept of, hey, I'm actually a thin client. I'm not running on the native platform here. And stuff like sound redirection with Pulse Audio is enabled, uh, virtual GL. So if you want to run uh, run a game or something and use the host system's GPU, you can do that because we don't have uh, 3D acceleration on the Raspberry Pi 2. So anyway, this is kind of what I'm considering a preview release. It's not even beta yet. There's some features. I still need to add and, and do so stay tuned for that and hopefully we'll be adding some new clients here soon I hear the Raspberry Pi 3 is getting really close on the free BSD side so I might have to roll that and I actually have a minnow board sitting here on my desk that uh, it looks very interesting as well we need to roll an image for that so check it out Okay, so next we have a Puppet Package Provider for FreeBSD's Package NG Package Manager Oh, that's yeah. cool So that's well, uh, I don't think this is new you think that's an old I'm one? I'm pretty sure this is one I've been using for a couple of years. <laughs> oh, well, shoot. Okay, how did that sneak in? <laughs> uh, I think Still, it's, like, it's been for updated. For those who don't but... know, Puppet does package mm-hmm. NG. <laughs> uh, I think this is slightly newer than the one I'm using. But... Okay. All right. Well, maybe it's got some new features or something. But again, if you're a Puppet user and we're wondering if you could do that, yes, you can do Puppet on FreeBSD. Alan uses it for a lot of stuff, so bug Alan. Oh, don't bug me. Way to go. <laughs> no bug, Alan. Okay. <laughs> okay. So next up, we have a notes from November's oh, London separate, BSD oh, sorry, meetup. Separately. They do have a Poudreur oh. module for Puppet. That I didn't oh, know okay. about. See, there is new hotness here. Go check it Hi, out. <laughs> so you can tell it, hey, compile this whole set of packages I need. Nice. nice. And it even creates the Nginx uh, server to export it and all that. Cool. That's pretty slick. Okay, so there's some neat new stuff there. So go check it out if you're a puppet master. So next up, uh, notes from the November London BSD meetup. We have a link to that. Um, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to highlight on those, Alan. Um, I have a couple of interesting things here. Uh, Nine Front is a plan to port uh, a fork of Plan 9 with enhancements. Uh, A new command called Theo, which appears to be somehow related to Fortune. So I can can just guess what that's about. It spouts a Theoism, yeah. I'm sure. It's also a link to lib troll. Interesting. <laughs> okay. It's also, yeah, it has troll as well. <laughs> yep. nice. uh, and then this is uh, a picture from MeetBSD that I hadn't seen. Uh, apparently, during lunch uh, one day, Kirk kind of uh, 
was sitting out in the courtyard and ended up with a circle of people around him and telling, uh, you know, the BSD oral tradition, telling stories and so on. Uh, I, All right, gather around the campfire, yes, my uh, children. Let us let us discuss the days. <laughs> I always like having uh, meals with Kirk. There's always very interesting. Mm hmm. Good stuff. Okay, so what's the next one here? I guess Semi Bugs having a meeting coming up. So we're letting you know well mm -hmm. ahead of time this time, December twentieth. So you have time to mark your calendar, make plans. You can get out to Semi Bug this time around. Uh, it sounds like it'll be seven p.m. Nice. Okay. Okay. Well, we got feedback and questions to get to really quick. Our last sponsor this week, which of course is going to be Tarsnap website for that tarsnap.com slash BSD. Now you want to go there, create an account. I'm sure most of you have by now. Come on, let's be honest. You need to do backups and a lot of you probably already are, but for those stragglers or maybe you're a new tune in, this is your first episode ever. So we got to tell you, you're going to need to do backups one way or another. You know, Z ZFS is great. For example, yes, you have raid Z two, three, that's not the same as a backup, though. For example, you know, we've had fires out here out where I live, and we just had tornadoes last night and bad wind and rain. So what if something floods your house and you lose what, what all the What if you accidentally energy? delete the wrong What's data that? set? <laughs> yes, yes. Like, there's still plenty of things that can happen. So it does make sense to have some sort of off-site backup. But not all off-site backups are created equal, of course. And the cool thing about TarSnap is it's the only off-site backup where you can trust that nobody's looking at your data on the remote end because uh, all the encryption's done on your client before any bits go out over the wire and only you have access to the encryption key. So once you've uh, encrypted it, if you decide you want to delete your backups, you don't have to trust that they are going to remove them from their servers you know, across the cloud. You can just shred the key, RMRF the key, shred it, get rid of it, there you go. Nobody's going to have access to your encrypted bits anymore. But a you know, consequence of that is make sure you keep that key really safe. Mm -hmm. Don't lose that. <laughs> Whatever you do. I print mine out and laminate it and put it in a safe place even just so I have a backup copy should the worst happen and we have a flood or a fire or something like that and lose all the uh, digital copies. But uh, anyway, you should get signed up today. Super, super cheap. Measured in Pico Byte dollars per month, which phew, that's it's darn uh, cheap. Pico dollars so, per byte uh, month. But. <laughs> well, byte month. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, but yeah, you'll want to go get signed up today. Clients for everything. The other cool thing is Tarsnap gives you the source code. So you can download it, compile it yourself. You don't even need to trust a binary provided by me or if you're a TrueOS user or if you're a FreeBSD user or Linux or whatever. Go compile it yourself. You can just make sure it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. So I'll get it signed up today. And of course, if you talk to anyone over there, tell them you heard about it here on BSD Now. Okay, so the first feedback here. So we have uh, Erno writes in asking about... Uh, uh, SSH without a pass. So he says, hi, Chris and Alan. I use Linux for my daily driver, but I've set up a FreeBSD 11 server in my basement to collect my backups. On the FreeBSD server, I have a Z pool, Z pool that's mounted on slash storage. The owner of storage is the user uh, CSAT Mimer, and he said this is where the home directory points to. I have another user as well, TuxMM with a home directory. He said, I've successfully set up TuxMM to log in via SSH without a password. He says he copied the pub to authorize keys, blah, blah, blah. Gone through all the steps to allow uh, CSAT miner to log in through SSH without a password. The problem is that the CSAT miner continues to ask me for a password. Any thoughts why? And then he gives us some of the permissions here. Um, if and the, the root storage directory allows group write, that might be the problem. In particular, if you look at uh, var log auth dot log or auth log, mm -hmm. uh, SSH will log an error explaining what the problem is. Uh, but the problem sure, is like permissions. Uh, if if yeah. group has write permissions of something in the chain, there they could uh, some user other than you could do nasty things to your SSH directory. Mm -hmm. So yeah, take a look. Hopefully that fixes uh, you it know, for you. You, you can it's... have the CSAT minor user have a regular home directory and still write its backup to slash mm -hmm. storage if that solves your permissions problems? That's what I've done personally. I just keep everything in slash home so it's all pointing in the same place and then I just have my backups go to slash yeah. backups. Uh, or because whatever. you probably want slash your backup directory to be group writable but uh, you're, you can't have the parent of the .ssh directory be group writable because then the group mm -hmm. can change the permissions of the .ssh directory and then yeah. Which is bad. But yeah, uh, bad the, things could happen. The varlog authlog will have uh, the error from SSH explaining why it didn't let you uh, log in with a key. Cool. Well, hopefully that helps you out. Okay, next up we have Jonathan writes in about magical ZFS. That's a good title. 
He said, I thought I'd share something surprising that happened to me and ZFS the other day. For a while now, I've had my desktop system set up so that it has two SSDs for the OS and home directory. Most of my data sits on a bunch of spinning hard drives. The two SSDs are in a Z-pool's mirrors, and the spinning drives are mirrored pairs in another pool. The interesting thing is that one of the two SSDs is 512 gig, while the other is one terabyte, which, of course, leaves 512 gigs free on the second drive. He said, PCBSD is smart enough that if I pick the smaller drive for the OS and the second drive is its mirror, the installer gives the second drive a partition, which is identical in size to one of the first drive, rather than making the partition and cover the whole disk, and then ZFS just not using it. Yes, I did do that. That is true. Thank you. Glad you noticed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He said, because the other drive in the VDEV was too small. He said, so I've had 512 gigabytes to play around with. At times, I've used it as a cache for my data pool, and at other times, I've just used it as a place to put some extra data, so as long as I can afford to lose it, since then it's in a pool by itself with no redundancy. Recently, I've used it for extra storage, and when something went wrong with my computer, it necessitated I reinstall the OS. I sent the data from the extra pool to another pool, so I could restore it after PCBSD had wiped out my installation when putting the new one on. So he said, so I installed PCBSD and then re-added the partition to the end of the one terabyte drive so that I could re-add the extra Z-pool. And lo and behold, what happens? Z-pool complains there's already a pool there. He said, that was unexpected. The dish was repart- repartitioned. The data uh, should well, be gone. Well, not exactly, right? When you yeah. delete the partitions, all you're deleting is basically the, the, the con- table tables. of contents at the front of the disk and, and yeah. GPT is also a second copy at the end. But if you recreate the partitions mm-hmm. table the same, yeah, your data is still there sitting at the offset. That's right. That's right. He said, now, obviously, Gpart didn't rewrite, overwrite the whole drive when you repartition it, just rewrites the partition table. But I'm used to thinking that if you repartition a drive and everything on it is toast. No, not at all, like Alan yeah. said. But, you but apparently, exactly. if you line up your new partition. <laughs> yeah. He said, if you line it up exactly the same spot as it was before, which if you're doing the same PCBSD install repeatedly, that would make sense. He said, ZFS is capable of recognizing what's there and using it. He said, I did a scrub of that Kapool, and it was completely fine. I didn't even need to restore it at all. It was completely unharmed in spite of the disk being repartitioned. It makes some sense when I think through the details of the partitions and how ZFS works, but it's just not something I ever would have mm-hmm. expected. But that is an interesting story, yeah. and I'm glad, hey, you didn't even have to do a scrub. Well, of the he, pool. he did to make sure that uh, you know nothing got overwritten, but yeah. Yeah, because um, yeah, ZFS yeah. keeps its own labels on inside the partition. The f- uh, mm-hmm. Each label is 128 kilobytes or 256, sure. 256 kilobytes, I think. Either way, there's uh, two labels at the very front of the disk and two labels at the very end of the disk. So you have four copies of the label, and as long as one of them is intact, uh, you can still use the device if the data is there. So we had a very interesting bug. Just as an aside, some of you may find this interesting, uh, about uh, six months ago, we ran into an install bug where the install would proceed perfectly, and then when you'd go to reboot, it would fail at mount root. And we were like, hmm, what is going on here? This is really, really odd. And what it turned out happened was these particular installs, somebody had installed with a Z-pool of tank and then repartitioned the disk, gave it some new sizes and installed another Z-pool as tank, but it hadn't cleared out or touched those parts where the first tank's information uh, was stored. So when it would go to mount root, it would see two tank Z-pools and it, yeah. couldn't, <laughs> it couldn't determine which one. So uh, this happens to <laughs> that was me a fun one. <laughs> because when IX runs their burn-in on the machines I buy, they create Z-pools on the disks uh, that are the entire disk with no partitioning. Then I mm-hmm. get the disk, you know, G part destroy and they create a partition table sure. and throw ZFS on it. But their labels are the first and last 512K of the disk. So while the first and the last one get munged by the GPT partition table, the label uh, two and three don't. And the bootloader can find those. Mm-hmm. Uh, and cause exactly this problem. Yeah. So yeah, in the in the FreeBSD installer, we have a bunch of code that actually like um, because of the same thing. There's a weird thing. So if you're doing the old-fashioned like UFS installs on MBR on FreeBSD, you actually create a master boot record, and then inside one of those partitions, you create a BSD boot record, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you delete the MBR, the BSD one disappears. But if you recreate the MBR, all of a sudden you find that BSD again. Um, and so we had to go so far as to create an MBR, then try to delete the BSD in cases there, and then delete the MBR, and then create a GPT and delete the GPT, and then create either the MBR or GPT that the user wants. Plus doing zpool clear minus F on every combination of device name. It's, it gets pretty crazy. 
Yeah, we we ended up having to implement something very yeah. similar, right? Just to make sure that well, it gets in particular, out so that what I'm thinking is again. actually making a G part command that just zeros the first and last one megabyte of the disk, and make sure that any labels from anything get quashed, uh, and mm -hmm. possibly the ability to do it to a, an individual partition as well. That's something yep. I would like to do. Although it involves okay. like, are you okay. sure you want to just clobber a bunch of data? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is true. Okay, so I'll get the next one here. George, he writes in about TrueOS, and I'll, I'll skim a little bit, George, because it's kind of long, but he said, I'm a long-time listener to the show, met some of you at EuroBSD conferences in the past. He said, I'm already on my way converting to BSD land of uh, things from Linux, having converted all my network and server machines, but most like, I think I'm still struggling with client machines in the forms of laptops, where I've found Ubuntu Linux lets me use most of the daily peripherals like printer, scanners, cameras, SD cards, etc. Um, he said, yes, I did try the bleeding edge releases of PCBSD in the past, but probably did not work because the vast variety of hardware and some peculiarities in the same model and combinations. Anyway, he says, I'm writing to say that the latest version of TrueOS is actually very, very close to having you replace Ubuntu in my laptop. What it means is it works. The screen resolution is what I get in Linux or Windows. HP lip functions is expected. Email, etc. All standard. Sound works. Lumina is nice. He said, I just have to say, wow, kudos to Chris and the team for their excellent work over the years, especially for this latest incarnation of FreeBSD for the desktop and laptop. I especially like the fact you're going to be following the bleeding edge stuff on the tree and one will get quicker access to new features and hardware. I also have to mention, this is a cool thing, I have to mention documentation here as well because the first time I opened that on a PCBSD 9X, I felt weird. What I mean is I did not expect to find anything that good and detailed for something I downloaded for free from the web. Past experiences, I guess. So I felt like I stole something maybe and there will certainly be a pop-up or two to start making donations now. Ha! Huh, no pop-ups and we didn't sell your data because we didn't collect any. So how about yep. thumb apples? Anyway. He said, uh, we people in IT spend a lot of time talking about all kinds of issues and important concerns like security performance and data integrity, uh, ability to configure and modify. But one thing trumps them all is when you need a computer you can do something on that you pretty much only care about that and the rest of it takes second place. He said, this is where I think Chris's efforts and quite naturally the efforts of all the people working on FreeBSD and the other BSDs in open source really help. But the proper packaging became critical, the adoption and growth and long-term viability of the technology. Ubuntu is very good at that and I'm glad to see that BSD land has its player too. Let's see. So he goes on a little bit about virtualization, but then he comes down to a question. He says, my laptop is a Lenovo X140E with an AMD processor and an ATI graphics card. For the Wi-Fi, I use a USB adapter as the default one doesn't work. Maybe a Broadcom or something. I'd be curious to know. But anyway, he said, so my problem is that when I hook up my larger 23-inch Samsung monitor with a 1920 by 1080 resolution, I can only get 1024 by 768 max on it. Needless to say, it's not ideal. I can see some errors in D message, including below, that indicate where the issue lies, but I'm not exactly sure how to decipher these and whether playing with X or XRNR configuration would have an effect. He says XRNR mode lines were not successful so far. And let me increase uh, the maximum size of the device. He said, also, as a general question, something I struggle with um, when, say, I look online to find a replacement wireless NIC that would be supported by FreeBSD is what steps or process should I take? Yeah, that is a little tougher one. Yeah. I've just kind of man take a look at the man pages for IWM or N, and usually they have model numbers listed on there. Yeah. And typically, <clears throat> I've been able to find those the, online. The big problem is that like, even with just a, a series of laptops, like, say, uh, the X140E or, say, you know X260 or something, is that oftentimes they will just mix and match the Wi-Fi cards. When I custom mm -hmm. built my yeah. T530, I had a choice of five different uh, wireless cards. And so I looked up the IWN man page and found one that other people had that I said it worked. Um, sure. But, you know, if you just bought a regular one, uh, one of the pre-built ones, you could have basically got any of those different cards, some of which worked and some know. of which didn't. No, or, or even like if you buy one laptop and then a little bit later you buy a second one, you know, like I know, um, I think uh, Pavel was having this problem buying uh, Lenovo laptops mm -hmm. for the people at his company. It's like we bought a bunch yeah. of this model and it was great. So we bought a bunch more and they came with a different Wi-Fi card that didn't work. Yeah. They'll just no, no, randomly we've, swap we've out parts on years. you in the same part number. It's like they'll sell it to you as the same it's part annoying. number, but it's not even the same thing. Yeah, and he, he mentions the same thing here. It would be nice if resellers would publish better information. Now, I agree. It would be nice, but not everyone does. We just have to request it more often so they know there's a demand for it. Um, but anyway, back to your problem about the graphics. So um, I don't have the D message info here. Maybe I messed it or something. But my guess is it has something to do with the DRM driver there. I'd have to well, see a little more info. Maybe your var log XOR yeah, log. Yeah, and it's an ATI well graphics card. When you plug card, it in. So. 
which is the support for that's really iffy. Um, but yeah, if you could send that info in or create a bug ticket somewhere on the tracker, we'll at least mm-hmm. take a look, see if there's anything of interest there that we could point to and say, oh, try this and I see wonder if that works. Like but uh, yeah, your var- the SCFB or something maybe would at least give him the full resolution. Well, this sounds like it's an external. Ah. It's not on his primary right. display. It's when he hooks up the second screen. Right. So I don't think SCFB will probably right, do depends that. Depends on the, the EFI. It doesn't do like yeah. the XR and R. Yeah. Mm. So, um, and the ATI driver I think is a little iffy there. So typically they will like the Intel driver for my laptop. When I went to the, do the conference, you know, it properly detects the resolution of the external screen, and I hooked it up with a Display Port to an HDMI adapter, and all that was fine. Um, but yeah, check, uh, send over your var log xor dot zero dot log, and then if you see anything relevant in var log messages, send that over as well. We'll see mm-hmm. what we can do. All right, I'll let you read yes. the next two, Alan. Uh, so, My voice sorry. is tired. Uh, Mohammed has an IP <laughs> or one. sorry, an IO cage question. He says, "Hi guys, uh-huh. big fan of the show. Thanks for your hard work. Keep it up." It's a- I have a dedicated server that I host my personal blogs and files for backups. I recently added a second IP address to get a jail for a website I've been hosting for my brother. I added the jail using the following command iocage create tag equals demo ip address equals em0 pipe ip address slash 32 the jail worked as expected but when i start the jail and the ip address is added the host nginx ssh and all the other services start listening on both ips is there a way to prevent nginx from listening on both ips other than using the listen ip colon 80 option i remember that uh, during one episode you guys talked about the above way to configure and so on so um if you start nginx in the jail it will listen on all the ips it has access to in the jail which will only be the one Mm -hmm. and it won't actually get through so even though the nginx on the host is listening on that port if nginx in the jail is running it will go to the nginx in the jail it can be slightly confusing Mm -hmm. because if the jail if if you stop nginx in the jail instead of getting you know this port's not open you'll get back the response from the nginx on the host so sure. you can uh, the only way to do it is to set the listen option on nginx on the host but you can if you're willing to deal with the fact that if nginx isn't running in the jail connections to the jail will fall through to the host then you can just start nginx in the jail and it will supersede the already listening nginx on the host uh mm-hmm. this one can be really confusing with ssh uh, you start SSH oh, yeah. in the jail I've done that. <laughs> uh, and it works fine. And then you forgot to actually enable it in rc.conf. So next time you restart the jail, you SSH in and you get the big scary warning. Ah, the keys changed because you're actually connected to the host. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, I, I don't ever bother telling the things on the host not to listen on all the ports because it's a bunch of work for no reason uh, other than mm-hmm. avoiding that SSH scariness. Well, and you could do some neat stuff with Nginx. So if the ho- if it falls through the host, you could have like a landing page that says, "Hey, the service is coming back in a second right. or whatever," and like do a refresh uh, yeah, or in whatever. Particular, right? some- if you created a separate vhost in the Nginx on the host that listened only on that one IP address, it would take higher priority in Nginx. And yeah, you'd be able to say, "Hey, you were trying to get to the jail. If you're connecting to the host, it means the jail's not running." And yeah, you could just say, mm-hmm. uh, "Try again in a minute" or something. Yeah, set a meta refresh 30 yeah. or something and be like, this will be back when the jail restarts yeah. or something. You know, that way your Plex comes yeah. back or what, whatever. But yeah, but anyway, uh, you shouldn't have to stuff. do anything. Just start Nginx in the jail and it should just work how you expected. Cool. Okay, okay. Yep. you got uh, the last one Depp here. here writes in asking about boot environments. He says, uh, thank you for your hard work on getting boot environments to work in FreeBSD and also integrating them into TrueOS. He says, I installed uh, FreeBSD 11 uh, beta on a laptop and somehow got my system into an unbootable state. Oh, sorry. Uh, this was after I already moved all my data back onto the disk and went to travel for two weeks. But with a USB stick that uh, having a recent TrueOS, I installed TrueOS into a new boot environment on the same system and got all my data back <laughs> and could rescue my main system. Yeah, you could also have just uh, booted off the FreeBSD uh, beta install image, and yeah, you can just import the pool. Even if it's unbootable, your data is still there. Don't take this away from me, Alan. That's a really cool feature in TrueOS. <laughs> you know, it's neat that he was able to use that to, to get back to mm-hmm. a bootable state. But then he also says, uh, that got me thinking, Illumos has had long uh, support for boot environments, and Linux is now starting to get that. Uh, would it be possible to put Illumos or Linux into different boot environments or boot uh, the different OSs off the same pool? It's like, well, actually, mm-hmm. if you check out the tutorial earlier in today's episode, uh, somebody actually described exactly how to do that. 
Uh, if my mm -hmm. data would be in different ZFS partitions, would it be a better dual boot system with different uh, GPT BIOS partitions uh, and much less wasteful? Yeah. So yeah, having all the different OSs as just data sets in your ZFS pool and then picking which one to boot from uh, Refined or, or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, it'll be great. So uh, yes, check out that tutorial earlier in today's episode. Yeah, yeah, coincidental, or maybe it wasn't. <laughs> anyway, glad I know uh, really other people have been asking me about that. I know uh, Michael Dexter's wanted to do Illumos and FreeBSD in the same pool for a while, so I sent him that link when it came up in the show notes yesterday. I was like, hey, check out this. You can do it for uh, at least Linux, and I imagine uh, yeah. it wouldn't be hard to... Uh, it'll be probably even easier to do it on Illumos now that it shares the same bootloader as FreeBSD. Do they have uh, EFI yep. booting? But they, they, okay, they, well, they yeah, have they FreeBSD bootloader. bootloader. Yeah, well then done. That should exactly. be a piece of cake. So, okay. Well, as we wrap up the show, we got to remind you here, of course, send your questions, comments. If you have show ideas or topics, a uh, story you found, you want mentioned on the show, please send those into feedback at bsdnow.tv. We live for mm -hmm. those things. We use those to make up a lot of the content of future episodes. So send that That's in. how we know if we don't what get you're to, interested uh, in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when you find neat stuff, I think a lot of cool stuff just comes from people finding weird things on GitHub that have been pushed that haven't gotten any publicity. So definitely some cool stuff out there. Make sure you send it in to feedback at bsdnow.tv. That's the only place we monitor. So if you want us to see it, make sure it goes there. And of course, we'll be back next week, same time with a new episode. Mm -hmm.